Hey everybody, Rhino here, the world's strongest pro bodybuilder and inventor of the cooler, the world's only cooler that holds a gallon of ice water and keeps your pre and post workout drinks all together inside one ice cold container. I've had a lot of requests recently for t-shirts and I finally got some in stock. I got a bunch of different designs you can check out at stanefforting.com including my new Rhino Raw t-shirt and the Signature Series effing shit up shirt. I know I'm pimping more shit on my videos now, but don't hate, I've got a four year old and a two year old, and Legos ain't cheap. But I'll tell you what, send me your kids old Legos and I'll send you a free t-shirt. Email me, we'll work it out. As for today's rant, what's the best way to recover from hard workouts? It seems as though everything that's been introduced to the fitness industry in the last 50 years has been in an effort to make things easier on people. Isolation machines, low impact exercises, treadmills, ellipticals, BOSU balls, you name it. When it comes to competitive athletics, that's exactly the opposite of what needs to be done to succeed. Back in the 1970s, Chuck Knoll's Pittsburgh Steelers won four Super Bowls, largely due to their savage defensive line, which came to be known as the Steel Curtain. Four NFL Hall of Famers played on that line together. Mean Joe Green, L.C. Greenwood, Dwight Mad Dog White, and Ernie Fats Holmes. With Terry Bradshaw as quarterback, Franco Harris as running back, and Lynn Swan as the wide receiver, they were un unstoppable. When I trained Paul Wiggins at the University of Oregon, and he was drafted to play offensive line for the Pittsburgh Steelers, it was nostalgic for me. I remembered myself as a young boy watching epic rivalries between the Steelers and the Cowboys year after year. When I got to college and started lifting, I trained at a Nautilus style gym full of machines and struggled for a few years to gain any appreciable size. Eventually I found my way to a hardcore gym full of bars, plates, and dumbbells. And when I asked about the lack of machines, I was told an old story which was probably more folklore than fact, but it went like this. The big meat necks in the gym told me to stay away from the machines. Free weights is all I needed. They told me that the Pittsburgh Steelers replaced all their free weights with Nautilus machines in 1980 to cut down on injuries. And that's when the steel curtain fell apart and everyone started getting injured and they started losing games. Whether it actually happened that way or not, the message was loud and clear. And I still say the same thing today, particularly for competitive athletes. Stay off the machines. Lifting free weights is harder, requires balance, coordination, stabilization, activates more muscles, and yields far better results. Squat, deadlift, overhead press, power cleans, weighted carries, chin-ups, dips, and rows. All the hard shit. Now let's switch gears and talk about recovery, keeping in mind that the same concept should apply. The harder shit, is far more effective than the easier shit. People always wanna know, what's the best way to recover from training? A list of potential remedies may include pills you can take, such as anti-inflammatories, glucosamine, turmeric, or omega-3s. Then there's passive therapies like cryotherapy, contrast showers, ice baths, hot tubs, and Epsom salt baths. There's very little practical or scientific evidence that any of the pills or passive therapies help at all. And they may actually hurt, as is the case with anti-inflammatories and icing, which reduces acute inflammation and restricts blood flow, which is critical for signaling the body's natural healing and repair response. Then there are treatments like massages, acupuncture, foam rolling, cupping, and others. I call these passive recovery methods as well. And some athletes feel better after using these methods, but I believe the results are minimal. Just think about it for a sec. If you're just laying there doing nothing, how effective can it really be? They go on my list of things that are done to you or for you, not by you. Things that are easy, not hard. Are they somewhat effective? Possibly. Sure, why not? But they're superficial and temporary. Then there are some effective methods that seek to restore blood flow where mobility is an issue and impingement may exist. Impingement is tantamount to immobilization. An impingement is a loss of movement and or a restriction of nerves or blood vessels. 
Whenever you immobilize a joint or muscle or restrict its blood flow or nerve activity, the muscles atrophy. Just look what happens when you put on an ankle brace or wear a cast. Immediate atrophy and loss of mobility. Movement through a full range of motion and restoring blood flow is key for recovery. Blood flow is everything. What you may perceive to be an injury could very well be a mobility problem, causing poor movement patterns that's unnecessarily placing stress on a joint and not allowing for adequate recovery due to restricted blood flow. Here's where active release therapy and other methods for restoring range of motion and releasing impingements can be very effective, just for the simple fact that they restore blood flow and activate nerves. Chris Duffin and Kelly Starrett have excellent content on their websites covering every joint in the body and how to improve joint integrity and mobility. I'll attach their links to the video. I go to an excellent doctor here in Las Vegas, Dr. John Petrick, who's the chiropractor for the UFC, and he's taken care of athletes on the Ultimate Fighter for many years. I regularly have him perform ART on my hips, glutes, spinal erectors, and shoulders. These methods by Dr. Petrick, Kelly Starrett, and Chris Duffin are intended to allow your joints to move unimpinged through their full range of motion. They restore blood flow and activate nerves. But that in and of itself is not enough. It just allows you to move without pain so you can now implement a recovery program and strengthen the muscles and joints. Once you've established a proper movement pattern, now you need to move. The best method to recover from hard training is active recovery. When you use specific, restricted, repetitive movement patterns, your body will close in around those patterns and become imbalanced. We see it in boxers whose shoulders are rounded forward, and power lifters who will develop tightness in the hips from heavy back squats. It's important to implement a mobility and recovery program that also strengthens the synergistic or opposing muscle groups so you can fix the imbalances that lead to impingements. Chris Duffin's shoulder rock is a great example of an active recovery method and joint strengthening method that stimulates the muscles through their entire range of motion, flexion, extension, abduction, adduction, and circumduction. In 2012, after I competed in the Flex Pro, and then I went and incline press 500 for reps in the animal cage a week later, my body was a wreck. My shoulders were so bad I couldn't put a dish in the cupboard. My hip was impinged and two separate surgeons performed MRIs and both said I needed hip replacement surgery. The hip was so painful it would throb at night and keep me awake. I couldn't drive a car or sit in a theater for any extended period of time. Both knees were so worn from tendonitis I couldn't even do a leg extension without pain and they felt bruised to the touch. I told everyone at the time I was done with bodybuilding and powerlifting and I would never compete again. Eddie Cohn had just gotten hip, hip replacement surgery and I intended to do the same, so I asked him about his surgery and he suggested before I get surgery, I should go to Mark Philippi and see if he could help me rehab my body. Mark Philippi is a former world's strongest man competitor and head strength coach for UNLV. He now owns his own training facility here in Las Vegas, the Philippi Sports Institute. Now Mark has put his body through hell and back and knows as much as anyone about injury rehabilitation and health maintenance. I visited Mark and he started me on a twice a week mobility program, which I documented on YouTube. And you can watch everything we did together. I'll attach the link or you can search for it under Stan Efforting Mobility. Within two months of working with Mark, I was pain free and able to start training the powerlifting movements again with reasonable weight. I suppose this is stuff I could have done at home, but I knew I never would. As disciplined as I like to think I am, if I hadn't gone to Mark, it never would have happened. Nor would I have worked as hard. Mark had me performing a full body mobility and active recovery program twice a week, including goblet squats, banded resistance work, shoulder mobility work, active stretching and core stability training. When you watch the video, you'll see that I'm sweating and out of breath, and we never use more than 25 pounds of resistance. The rest is history. I went from limping and contemplating surgery in the spring to squatting 905 pounds in training in the fall, and ultimately totaling over 2,300 pounds raw. I've always said that I do more outside the gym than inside the gym in order to allow me to continue training. Behind the scenes, weekly ART with Doc Petrick, 
and twice weekly mobility work with Mark Philippi are the only reason I was able to compete at such a high level in my mid 40s. And my current regimen of active recovery is the only reason I can still train hard without pain now that I'm almost 50. Movement is key. When my 86 year old dad got hip replacement surgery, they had him up using a walker the next morning. When Eric Spoto had his shoulder surgery, they sent him home with a machine that moved his arm in circles for many hours a day. Now 15 years ago, when one of my athletes got knee surgery, the surgeon sent him home with a compression cuff hooked to an ice machine. It immobilized and froze the area. And guess what happened? It didn't heal. At most top colleges and professional sports facilities, there are submersion treadmills or harnesses to allow athletes to move injured muscles and joints under reduced loads so they'll heal faster. The key again is movement. The heart pumps the blood full of nutrients which helps repair the damaged muscles and joints. Acute inflammation is good. It's part of the body's natural response that initiates healing. The lymphatic system rids the body of toxins and waste. Unlike the heart, which pumps blood throughout the body, the lymphatic system doesn't have a pump. It relies on muscular contractions or movement to help rid the body of waste materials. Oftentimes when I was too tired or too lazy to do active recovery and I would just sit or lay down or sleep, I would wake up feeling like I was in a car accident. My muscle soreness would be more intense and last longer than if I would have simply performed my active recovery sessions. What are some good active recovery methods? Now depending on the athlete and the specific demands of their sport, I'm always careful to make sure the type of active recovery used is consistent with their goals. And what I mean by this is that the body responds to the stimulus provided. I call it signaling. If I'm trying to build large muscles for bodybuilding or optimize strength for powerlifting, then I pick an active recovery method that doesn't send the wrong signal to the body. For me, I would use HIT style active recovery under moderate loads and try to utilize mostly concentric movements and avoid eccentric loads that may further break down the muscle I'm trying to heal. It's important for progress to allow the hypertrophy phase to complete. Let the muscles heal and adapt to the stress by getting bigger and stronger and then hit them with more stress. To be specific, the day after leg day, when I wake up, I'll perform 30 second sprints on a recumbent bike under moderate tension with one minute rest. I'll do about 10 or 12 of these. I'm able to pump a lot of blood into the muscle without breaking down muscle tissue and without using an endurance stimulus. It drastically speeds up the rate of healing for my knees and leg muscles, and it only takes 10 minutes. When I was competing in powerlifting, I would put a recumbent bike in my room and perform these hit sessions three to four times a day when the training loads were the greatest and delayed onset muscle soreness was at its worst. Now pushing and prolling a prowler under moderate load is another great active recovery method. It gets your heart rate up, moves your legs through a significant range of motion, and drives a lot of blood to the muscles and joints. I found sprinting stairs to be another beneficial method. Sprint up, walk down. Now regular sprinting, however, causes eccentric damage from the decelerating force on the muscles. Even something as simple as air squats can provide a huge benefit. Active recovery should get your heart rate up. It should require you to move through a full range of motion. It should pump up the muscles and draw blood to the joints. It should make you sweat. And it should be, as recovery goes, hard. So quit doing the easy shit and start doing the hard shit that works. Move your body when it needs it and your body will move you when you need it. Well, that's my rant. And as always, thanks for listening.